For over a decade, one single website would reign terror over the entire internet. Political figures, celebrities, and news outlets would also face the brute force of what could only be described like an internet hate machine. 4chan used to be held to standards that are unrivaled to this day. In fact, you weren't even allowed to talk about it. Now listen, I'm not going to talk about f***ing that much because I know the rule, it's like Fight Club. You don't talk about f***ing. Hacking, blackmailing, and public harassment used to be a common fear amongst the internet. However, 4chan wasn't only just chaos and hatred, as I discussed four times that 4chan warned the internet. On July 21st, 2014, a user with the trip code IDF Deserter created a thread titled Goodbye. And within minutes, the thread would garner large amounts of traffic. IDF Deserter wrote the following. I can't take this anymore, guys. Me and my squad were ordered to demolish a hospital because it was supposedly a Hamas de facto HQ. I know this is not true because I was sent to that hospital on an undercover mission not too long ago, and there was nothing there, just the nice staff. I left the battlefield as I now know the true intentions of my higher-ups. I will probably be tortured and left in jail for quite a while for deserting, but I don't care anymore. Too much innocent blood on my hands. Goodbye, Pole. I've had a fun time hanging here. Don't give up hope and I hope you live a good life. Users in the thread were quick to split into both sides of skepticism. Some instantly called this a hoax, while others began bombarding with questions, demanding to know more. Without saying another word, OP posts a picture of what appears to be his own dog tags and an Israeli passport along with a note to show that this isn't just some image found off of Google thus proving that this could very well be someone who just abandoned the battlefield. OP claims that his connection is weak at best, but will try to answer some questions. Can you share some more information? What is the hospital's name that is going to be attacked? Alaxa or something. It was in the Darbala neighborhood, if you know it. Last post. Goodbye for the last time, everyone. I have some family in a neighboring country. I will leave sometime later tonight. I won't let them take me. I'll probably return to 4chan when everything calms down. You have been my only true friends. Thank you. And with that, OP departs the thread never to be heard from again. No more updates from the IDF deserter, and no more pictures. When suddenly... It's happening. OP's legit. A user posts a breaking news article that states the following. Deaths as Israeli tanks shell Gaza hospital. Civilian toll rises as patients die in the Al-Aqsa hospital in third attack on medical facility since start of offensive. And it's not long until BBC News reports. Gaza conflict. Five dead at hospital hit by Israeli strike. At least five people have been killed and 70 injured by an Israeli strike on a hospital in Gaza. Palestinians say. Now, there's speculation that the time of the threat was actually after the article, and that IDF deserters simply found the article and made a fake thread. However, that still leaves his photo to be discussed. Was this Anon attempting to warn others of a war crime about to be committed? Or was it just a troll post to rally up reactions on 4chan's political board? July 2nd, 2020. A user creates a thread on 4chan's paranormal board, X. The thread is titled, Storytime with a Dead Man. 
In this thread, he discusses his time working as a security guard and potential trafficker for Jeffrey Epstein. The following story contains graphic and disturbing descriptions, including suicide, assault, and murder. The stories and information posted here are artistic works of fiction and falsehood. Only a fool would take anything posted here as fact. Story time with a dead man. I'm going to kill myself tomorrow, X. I'm also sending three packets of copied information to the media. One to CNN, one to MSNBC, and one to Fox News. You all will have to see which one tells the truth about the information that they receive, and which one doesn't. I trust 4chan to do this because of our history of releasing legit info in the face of mass media cover-up. I have been a professional driver slash security guard for a circle of very wealthy people for almost eight years. I started by working the door at a private gentleman's club outside of the DC area. From that job, I was introduced to some employment managers for Jeffrey. Because I had experience as both a cab driver and a bouncer, as well as always overlooking and keeping my mouth shut about the drugs and prostitution that my employers at the club profited from, they thought I'd be a good fit to work the weekends for Mr. Epstein. At first, I didn't do very much. Definitely nothing important. I would run errands mostly and do anything my manager, who reported directly to Mr. Epstein, wanted me to do. So say the gardener calls out sick one day. It would be me mowing the lawn in his place. I was sort of a floating general helper. Inevitably, I ran into Mr. Epstein now and then, and he was always very personable, enthusiastic. I had heard about his original court case and the rumors and everything, but just meeting this guy made me feel like it was all a lie, because he seemed so kind and genuine. I thought he really was just this hotshot money man, like a Bruce Wayne or Tony Stark kind of figure. And I think, ultimately, that's how he wanted us all to see him. His god complex was, to say the least, very developed. Eventually, I was trusted with bigger jobs. I think I got a good reputation because I cleaned one of Mr. Epstein's bedrooms one day. There was, to my dismay, a mixture of shit and on the bed sheets. I dealt with it professionally and I didn't say anything. I knew by then that someone is always watching. There are cameras in almost every single room, save Mr. Epstein's private office and regular bedroom. He had several bedrooms, but one was his favorite, I guess. His main room. I never mentioned it to anyone, but I still got a thank you from my manager for being discreet. One day, I was asked to go pick up a masseuse from a bus station. I didn't ask her her age, I knew better. But she couldn't have been older than 16. I got a really bad feeling in my stomach because at this point, Denying Mr. Epstein's tastes would be borderline irrational. I did my job, though. I took her to his house, and a few hours later, I took her back to the bus stop. She was crying, and I didn't talk to her about it. A few weeks later, I did it again. Now my manager tells me that Mr. Epstein would like me to take over all of his various pickups and drop-offs. They called it cutie duty. Fucking barf. But... It was more than just girls. I would pick up drugs and other assorted packages, most of which I had no idea the contents, but as far as I was concerned, the less I knew, the better. I was getting paid very well for the amount of work I was doing. In a given day, I spent three, maybe four hours doing anything that would be considered work. The rest of the time, I either sat in my car browsing 4chan on my phone, or inside pretending like I was rich and this was my house. For this, I was being paid 75k a year, more than I'd ever even hoped to have made in my whole life. When I took over doing most of the driving, it went up to 115. Every time my job became more illegal, the money would get better. That is his tactic. He knows that people will do just about anything for the right price. I guess I just want people to know, call it a public confession because, well, I'm guilty. I guess I don't care that much because I'm going to be dead. I've done things I can't forgive myself for, and 
I think they'll have me killed anyway. So, I'm going to do it on my terms. Anyway, Mr. Epstein is very shrewd. He pays you a lot, but not enough for the shit you have to do. And he tries to find the absolute least amount he can pay to keep you doing it. For me, disgracefully, that was around 150k. I stayed on QD duty for about 4 months. Then Mr. Epstein took a trip abroad, and he loaned me out to another family. The Now, keep in mind, I never met Mitch, and I don't think I even worked for him. I just worked for the family. I reported to an employment manager as usual. I was tasked with driving a young man named Cole around wherever he wanted. Cole was probably 22 and already his license had been suspended for drunk driving. He lived in a huge house out in the middle of nowhere outside. Man, it was beautiful. If I could have stayed there forever, I would have. I suspect it was a vacation cabin slash mansion owned by his parents, but I digress. Every weekend, we would drive into the city, he would get shit-faced drunk, find a woman or a prostitute, and i will take us all back home. Cole was a piece of total piece of shit. If you remember scumbag Steve, just imagine if Steve's parents were multi-millionaires, if not billionaires, and you get the idea. So one Sunday morning, after a typical Saturday night, I report for duty 8 a.m. sharp, knowing damn well that Cole isn't going to drag his house out of bed until at least 3 p.m. Here he comes hobbling down the driveway in his socks to my car. He usually texts when he's up, and I come inside and start cleaning up his messes. No text today. He comes over to the car as I'm stepping out. He says, Uh, hey buddy, he kinda got a problem, but it's not that big of a deal. Okay, what? Let's see it. We go inside, upstairs to his bedroom. His girl from last night is lying face up, and her open mouth is pulled with vomit. She is most definitely dead. Far as I can tell, she overdosed on whatever combination of prescription drugs that they were doing, then passed out, puked, and suffocated on her own vomit. I'm absolutely flipping my shit, and I've got my phone out dialing 911. Cole slaps it out of my hand and tells me to hold on. He says he can't get in trouble because it'll look bad on his family. I said, Cole, you've already been getting into trouble. He says he knows, just not this kind of trouble. He says I'll get a big bonus if I just deal with it myself. Now I'm way out here in the middle of nowhere, and the implication from day one of my employment in this circle has been that if I mess up, I might suffer harsh consequences. I know what I did here was wrong. I know that. And I am so sorry. I asked him what I'm supposed to do. He says, just wait. He gets a different phone out of a drawer and starts making calls. After a few minutes, I'm waiting in the hallway. He's casually pacing around the corpse. He gives me GPS coordinates for a little spot off of 111 out in the mountains. I'm supposed to wrap her up, take her there, and drop her off. He said there would be guys waiting there to take her. It's a long drive and I don't look forward to it one bit. I wrap her up in his comforter. He stops me. Bro, he says. Bro, not that blanket. That's like the softest blanket in the world, dude. No way. And he gets me a different blanket from the closet. Fucking real gentleman Cole was. He's got an F-150 at the property used for landscaping work. I put her body in the bed with a tarp on top, and then I fill the rest of the back with landscaping supplies, fertilizer, tools, etc. I tried to make it look really natural and boring. I'm shitting bricks. I can't believe I'm actually doing this. But he's promising me that if I get busted, I'll have the best lawyer's money can buy. And I believe him. She's dead already anyway, and it's unlikely he would even get into any real legal trouble. Just bad press. So, what's the difference? The whole time driving, I'm just sweating right through my clothes. I have to stop twice to puke. When I get there, there's a little dirt spot you can pull off into. And sure enough, there's a big black SUV and a Jeep with off-road tires. I'm not about to just assume these are the body people, so... I stop and get out and I'd approach the SUV. 
the window rolls down and there's a woman who's probably in her 50s and a big guy driving. I don't know what to say, so I'm just kind of like, uh, how's it going? Feeling like a complete fucking idiot. She makes a call and describes me to the person on the phone. Then she puts it down and says, where who are you looking for? Is it under all that stuff in the bed? I say, yeah, do you need help? She says, no, take a break. So I walk into the trees a little bit and smoke a cigarette or two. They've got her out and put her in the Jeep within about five minutes. The woman tells me to wait 15 minutes before I leave. Then they pull out and drive away. The Jeep drives further into the woods. I wait maybe seven minutes and I leave. I got a text later telling me not to ever leave early again. It was from a blocked number. So when I get back to the house, Cole is sitting at the kitchen table eating a massive bowl of Fruit Loops and watching Love and Hip Hop. This man is like a child and he hasn't even gotten dressed yet. He asks me to wash his blankets and sheets. I do it. We got really drunk that night and Cole tells me that this has happened twice before and it's always fine. He says he's like Scarface. I hate him. The remaining few months go by without incident and he gets his license back, freeing me at last. Mr. Epstein doesn't need me at the time, but I do get referred as a reliable driver to the big wigs at who assigned me to work on crew while she promoted at that time, her sixth and newest album. I never met in person, just in passing now and then, but I found this job to agree with me a lot better than the others. I drove a van stacked with promotional gear from city to city while she toured. A few times, I was sent to pick up Molly and was taught to use test strips to test for purity. If it was not pure, I was supposed to walk away, but it was always pure. There are circles within circles of connections. I believe that there is an entire shadow economy strictly for the rich and famous to get their rocks off collectively. One thing I did learn about her is that she enjoys young females as well. I was sent to pick up two young girls and bring them to her hotel room. Of course, I was met outside the door by someone more important than me. This struck me as odd because as far as I understand, she is not a billionaire like Epstein, but she was even more insulated and protected than he was. I'm sure a lot of that has to do with just personal choices regarding security, but I get the picture that in this world, influence and money both equal power. And her, especially in 2011 and 2012, was highly influential. All I had to do was mention her name and girls would get in the car, just like that. Cigarette break, boys. My nerves are so shot. I keep thinking I hear cars pulling up. I'm getting really paranoid. Give me a couple minutes. So the most noteworthy thing that happened while working for is when she had a party to celebrate the end of her tour. Everybody was there. I mean, all of the pop stars were there. And even a few old heads, like, and some actors. I noticed for sure, just to name a few. For this party, I was, of course, tasked with getting entertainment. They wanted as young as I could get, and as many as I could get. Ostensibly, they were being hired to be waitstaff and valet drivers. But the plan is to switch it up on them when they actually get there, to give them drugs, money, whatever they need to do, what they wanted them to do, which was essentially to be all expenses paid prostitutes for whoever wanted them. That part, thankfully, was not my job. I'm just a piece of shit who tricked them into going. I picked up five young girls from a mall, a couple of teenage boys I found walking around the road, and then I got a hold of an escort company to fill it out and make it an even dozen. The ones from the escort company were not underage and I was severely chastised for it. My manager basically asked if I ever wanted to work again. I said yes. He said, then act like you've got some goddamn sense. I didn't make this mistake again. After the tour ended, I was just on my own for a month or so. I rented a house near Tulsa and basically isolated the entire time. 
I was starting to get ideas in my head about going to trade school or something. When I was called back to come to work for Mr. Epstein again. At this point, I've developed a bad coke habit, of which I had only been sober a few months to this day. I needed something to make me do it. Coke makes you feel numb in a way that not much else does. And believe me, I've tried just about everything. There are research chemicals that no one has even heard of that get traded around in these circles. When I came back to work for Mr. Epstein on his island, I was going through an eight ball every day or two. I binge drank at night, but I had to keep focused during the day. The coke wired me up and the liquor brought me back down. That's the only way, mentally, that I could really cope with what's happening. I was flown to his now infamous island to be one of the regular staff. Essentially, I lived on this island for free while getting paid to maintain the grounds and keep the buildings up. When Mr. Epstein was there, obviously he would bring his own entertainment, so I didn't even have to do that. I thought, this sounds like a fucking fantastic deal. Island paradise, great wages, not much real work. Count me in. Out of all of my sins, I believe sloth is the most damaging one that I indulge in. I always look for the easy dollar, and that's why I am prey for people like this. Now, first of all, this island is like paradise on earth. It's always a comfortable temperature. The rains are breathtakingly beautiful, and the architecture and decor of houses are exquisite. Yes, the bathhouse is really creepy. The fake doors are there to confuse flyby surveillance, if anyone was wondering. The other regular staff were hard to get along with. They were all creeps, and I mean capital C fucking creeps. Made me wonder about myself, honestly, that I'm put here with them. They all joked about getting Mr. Epstein's leftovers, and the talk was constantly about when Mr. Epstein was going to visit the island again. When he would bring important people, world leaders, CEOs, and etc., I and most of the staff were kept totally out of sight. We weren't allowed to work in an area unless we knew it was empty. Only his most trusted employees could actually be in the building with him and his high-powered friends. Sometimes, though, it would just be the family and things were more relaxed. I passed by his office once, carrying some garbage, when he beckoned me inside. He asked me my name, and I told him. He offered me a seat. I took it. You don't get far in this business by saying no. He began to talk to me. He looked really stressed. He asked me how anything that feels good could be bad. He had a big painting of Oscar Wilde and considered him a personal hero. He began to explain hedonism to me and asked me if I understood. Of course, I said. Who doesn't like fun? Lots of people, he said. Then he let me go about my duties. I fucked up really bad one evening and entered one of the maintenance sheds to return some tools that I'd been using and saw the sweaty, pale back of a large man hunched over and he had a tattoo of Nixon on his back and he was wearing a bull's head mask. He was one of the regular stuff members mouth. He turns to me and I'm just standing in shock and says quite angrily, do you mind? And I slam the door shut. As I'm closing the door, I get a glimpse of my coworker's face and he's crying. I googled Nixon back tattoo later and realized that man was who I've never even heard of up to that point. I knew I was in deep shit. The next day and for two weeks after, I got all the worst jobs. Trash pickup, cleaning toilets, scrubbing his boats. It fucking sucked, but I kept my mouth shut anyway. As far as I understood, my pay had not been cut, so whatever. I do the shitty jobs where I'm by myself because, at least, hey, I'm by myself. That was fine with me. OP, if this isn't a LARP, then I have to tell you I wish you the best. And honestly, you did a lot of bad shit. And I hope you recover, since you seem like a good guy. If you are LARPing, the nice job, since I'm entertained and this is a good LARP. I'm not a good guy, but thank you. If this was the movies, the Punisher, or whoever, would rip my spine out of my back. And... 
I deserve it. I'm not a good guy. Anyway, things started getting really tense on the island from that point. People started making little comments to me about being nosy or about minding my own business. I was starting to get worried I'd be branded a troublemaker, which you do not want to be. Things turned very quickly in this business. That's how they've kept a lid on it for so long. Any small mistake, and you're out. Most people are let go with NDAs and the understanding that they will be watched the rest of their lives, which ultimately is how I got out as well. After Epstein died, they cut me loose. I guess they figure since he's dead, nothing I would know would matter anyway. They're probably right, honestly. It probably won't matter anyway. But the rest of my time on that island was pure terror. I was just waiting to be taken away, or worse. It never happened, but I was still really scared. I saw a few of their weird plays that they would do around the bathhouse. Mr. Epstein had a little portable stage he would get set up. He would wear the bull head that I saw wearing and give a big speech about what he called freedom. He would say this island is the only free place in the whole world where everyone on it can do whatever they want. Bullshit. Not your employees. Not the children you bring here. Total bullshit. Everyone would cheer. They would get up and do a sort of conga line with tiki torches. Really cringy old rich people shit. And go into the bathhouse. There was a trap door on the floor that has not been reported in any of the investigation photos that I've seen, which led to what they call the chamber. And it is essentially a bondage dungeon. I don't know what all happened in there, and I never want to know. I stayed as far away from that bathhouse as I could. So, anyway, eventually I got my reputation for the most part back into good graces, and I was working in the main houses again. One time, I was helping in the kitchen. I don't know if the chef was fucking with me, I hope so, but he was separating what looked to me like the torso of a very young, skinned pig. It had been roasted, and he was chopping it in the quarters. The ribs to be served that evening, and the rest broken down for soups and casseroles. I said jokingly that it looked like a little kid. He just gave me this awful dead-eyed look for a second and said, Watch it. I worked on that island for about a year. In 2013 to 2014, Mr. Epstein chose me and two other trusted employees from the island to come with him to a winter retreat in the Swiss Alps. He owned a small, well, billionaire, small mind you, cabin, and wanted people he knew could be trusted because most of the staff would be local hires. Our job on the surface was to help manage all the employees, like supervisors basically, but the unspoken task would be keeping everyone either in the dark or quiet. Mr. Epstein had a real fondness for plump young Swiss blondes, and the Swiss, as he would explain, have a very progressive idea regarding the age of consent. He viewed this as a more relaxed way to do what he does, more casual. Part of the thrill for these people, I think, is in the fact that it is illegal, and they could get in big trouble. When they go to places that are more friendly with the idea of older man having s it's to take a break, so to speak. The Alps themselves, though? Wow. I mean, wow. I've been all over the United States, and nothing in this country compares to Europe in terms of sheer beauty. Sometimes, early in the morning when I would come out of my cabin and stretch, I would just look at the trees, smell the crisp, clean air, and just for a minute, I would forget what I've done and what I am doing. When it came back to me, I would have to fight back tears. I want the mountains there to be the last thing I think about before I die. Sorry, I'm taking breaks to peek out my windows like a crackhead. I might actually bail and go find open Wi-Fi somewhere. Maybe in another state. I don't know. I'm just getting more and more paranoid. My lights flickered and I almost shit myself. I think I might get back on the wagon just for tonight and go get some liquor. 
be a little patient with me. So I've not been there three days when, while me and two from the island are doing bumps of coke off of a butter knife in the lower garage, a boy, maybe 14, skinny, blonde, pale, and naked, comes through the doorway right towards us. He's speaking French, but I think I got the gist of what he was saying. He was asking for help. He looked hysterical. Immediately, my two friends were out of there, and I shouldn't have been far behind. I told him, calm down, calm down, it's okay, I'm gonna help you. I just wanted him to feel better. This all took maybe 30 seconds before one of the nannies came in. He looked at her, confused, and I get the picture that he was trying to decide if she could be trusted. She couldn't. She shushed him, put her jacket over him, and took his hand. She was speaking French as well, and it sounded like a mother consoling a frightened child. She led him back into the house, and I did not see him again. I never mentioned it to anyone, and nobody ever mentioned it to me. During my last couple of weeks there, I witnessed firsthand the murder of an independent journalist. I don't think he was actually a journalist. I think he had maybe a blog or a YouTube channel, but I had never heard of him and I don't know his name, so I don't think he was anyone with any real connections. He was one of the local hires, a dishwasher, but he was seen with a cell phone out, possibly recording. Me and the other two from the island were asked to go check it out. So we go get the guy and ask him to empty out his pockets. And sure enough, he's got a phone. We told him to unlock it and he wouldn't. One of the other guys made a call, came back, and slugged him directly in the nose. I think he broke it because there was blood just pouring out and the guy started screaming. I don't think he'd ever been hit before, but me and the other guy held him down. Fuck it, I'll say their names. It was Daniel and Marcus. Marcus and I were holding him down and Daniel punched him again and told him to unlock his phone. He complied this time and sure enough, there were pictures and videos from inside the house. We knew he hadn't sent anything out because only wired connections worked there. I guess they had signal jammers or something or maybe because it was just so remote, I don't know. Anyway, Daniel makes another call and tells us to take him outside into the woods. I think we're just gonna threaten him and make him sign an NDA, but Daniel took his belt off and strangled him to death. We had to put his body up in an outbuilding because the ground was frozen. We put him through a wood chipper and then burned everything to ash. There were bits of charred bone left over when I swept it all into a trash bag and I threw it out with the regular garbage. This above anything else. I feel the most guilty for. After that, if I wasn't in before, I was definitely in now. Me, Marcus, and Daniel, the three fucking stooges from hell. Daniel had been in the military and I think he had a few screws loose because he always had a temper. He became the go-to guy for the really dirty shit. I started working for Mr. Epstein directly after this. He would confide in me sometimes, when he was very high, about how nothing really makes him feel good enough. He told me once that he hasn't felt happy in years. I wish I had the stones to tell him that this life he is living is only bringing him down. For a brief moment, I felt empathy for this man. I think that too was part of his game though. I don't think he has ever had a single genuine feeling in his life outside of sexual gratitude. He never mentioned the journalist to me. It was like it never happened. But we both knew that was the reason that I was now working directly for him. Listen, I think I've said about all I care to right now. I'm going to go get a bottle of something before all the stores close. If this thread is still here in a few hours, I'll answer questions and tell some more stories. You ever see occult stuff on the island? Robes, pentagrams, rituals, that kind of shit? 
They called them plays and theater, but from my eyes, yeah. I would say the speeches and stuff that I saw looked a lot like rituals. The bull's head mask was scary. I mean, it was a rubber mask for sure, but whoever spoke would wear it all night. After they would come out of the chamber, the masked person would roam the island, and it was generally understood that you are to avoid them at all costs. When they wear the mask, they're like animals. They just wander around from one carnal satisfaction to the next. Food, sex, sometimes violence, whatever. And they could do whatever they want. If they came to you and told you to whatever, you have to do it. It never happened to me, thankfully, but I made sure on those nights to stay out of sight. And that would be OP's final confirmed post. Eight hours after OP's last post on the thread, Ghislaine Maxwell would suddenly be arrested by the FBI and charged with conspiracy, enticing minors to engage in sex and more. This could easily be a massive coincidence. However, the timing is almost too on point. And before I get on to the next part, I would also just like to throw in that someone once reported Jeffrey Epstein's death or suicide before his body was even discovered or before it was even reported. It's Christmas, 2013. The Wii U was still marketed as a successful console, so this user buys one and claims that it was broken. He opens the inside and finds what he thinks to be poop. He creates a thread, probably expecting to make the next meme on 4chan's video game board, but once realizing it isn't exactly feces, he cracks it open. What the hell is this? OP then begins to dump more photos until he reveals that whatever this thing used to be is now infested with spiders. At least the spiders are already dead. Whatever happened, it's an egg that opened too soon or an egg that never managed to open. The spiders must have devoured each other to stay alive and eventually grew to max capacity and truly died. The size shows they're adults, but the colors show that they literally have no plating or skin. The spiders live lives like we did, in the fucking dark. That is, until OP returns. This one was still alive. Needless to say, users are less than thrilled about this news. He literally ate his brothers to fucking stay alive. What the fuck? He's some sort of super spider. What did you just unleash upon the world? As chaos ensues, another poster adds gasoline to the fire. That's not an egg. That's a dirt dauber nest. The spiders are paralyzed inside of it. If they're not dead by now, and they're actually fresh catches, they're going to be waking soon. For context... A dirt dauber, or a mud dauber, is a wasp that specifically hunts spiders. It grabs its victim and stings it, injecting a paralyzing venom into the spider. Afterwards, the wasp takes the victim to the nest where it is eventually consumed by the wasp's larva. So what we're looking at here is a nest full of either already dead spiders, or spiders that are still paralyzed. This spider kind of looks like a brown recluse. If you let it sting you, your arm's gonna start rotting while you're alive. Other posters explain the severity of the issue while others, rightfully, lose their mind. I don't think the threat is understanding the magnitude of the situation here. OP just opened a wasp nest, a wasp nest full of poisonous spiders. Poisonous spiders that make your skin and flesh rot off if they bite you. They might not even have wasp larvae in them, in which case, they're paralyzed and just awaiting to be awoken. And for the fuck of it, let's add this theory to the mounting fire. Guys, if OP had this in his Wii U, then it can't just be one of them. What if an employee put one of these in everybody's Wii U at the store that OP goes to? Nobody knows where on earth OP lives, but you could be living right next to him and buying a Wii U from the same store he goes to. Just imagine it. 
you could be buying a Wii U with one of the same things that Obi has. And that's how 4chan users spent their Christmas that year. Not with family, not with friends, but instead with debilitating fear that mayhaps their very Nintendo Wii U console comes with flesh rotting spiders. Okay, time to debunk this story. The story is actually false, and if we check the Wayback Machine, you can find that the original pictures actually came from the subreddit, r slash WTF, before OP posted it to r slash pics. The actual story is that a man discovered a wasp constantly returning to this hole that he had in his wall. He finds the nest, and well, it just gets much worse from there. In the last picture he posts, you can actually see a wasp larva right next to its meal. So while the Wii U story isn't real, the spider situation still very much was for this one individual. However, the idea of this being in a Wii U is much funnier. By this point, I believe that the majority of us know what a skinwalker is. Of course, memes on Instagram and Reddit ended up being vastly incorrect about what a skinwalker actually is. But the term might still be familiar to you. And if not, then a skinwalker is known to be a witch of the Navajo region. Once human, these witches or warlocks would get lured in with the temptations of black magic, resulting in them doing horrid acts that were deemed unforgivable by human nature. Usually, it meant cannibalism or murder. Afterwards, the witch would transform into a monstrous being, thriving off of an incurable hunger. It is believed that human meat is the only thing that temporarily satisfies the skinwalker's hunger. It is said that this creature is so feared by the Navajo tribes and culture that they refuse to ever discuss the idea with outsiders. So it doesn't come as a surprise that it took the internet ages to finally discover it. And where else to be discovered than 4chan's paranormal board, X. Of course, speculation can be all over the place, along with skepticism, but in my opinion, it wouldn't be until 2012 that a 4chan story would put the term skinwalker on the map, Anansi's Goatman. Many of the characteristics described in this chilling story would go on to be used as almost a fitting stereotype, if not cliche, for future skinwalker stories. Characteristics such as physically laughing without sound, the atmosphere smelling like copper or burnt hair. The creature shape-shifting and poorly mimicking its surroundings. Amanda? <laughs> its voice being described like a yowling cat. That last one might sound kind of off, but without context. Over the last decade, skinwalker stories have become massively popular on X and K, some being a bit more obviously fake, but it's fair to say that these stories nonetheless are chilling. So, controversially speaking, and of course from an open-minded perspective, is it safe to say that 4chan users may have been trying to warn us about these cryptids, a creature so evil that its own tribe believes that its name is a cause for bad luck? That 4chan may have been warning us to not be so naive when it comes to hiking land untouched by humanity. The backrooms have completely taken the internet by storm. And honestly, for good reason. The concept of this alternate reality shares a lot of creative similarities to the SCP Foundation, a universe where possibilities are quite literally endless, infinite. Every big YouTuber has talked about the backrooms, but what some people might not know is that the backrooms lore actually originated from 4chan. If you don't know what the backrooms are, well then, do I have a thread for you. It all starts from this specific yellowed image, which originally was created just for liminal art. This was the case for many months until users finally would go on to invent what we now refer to as the backrooms. 
Theory one. Back room? That's fitting. Maybe too accurate. I call it the real estate. There's a lot for me to explain on the subject as I was for many years trying to figure out its mystery. First of all, real estate is what it points to be representing, but cannot be truly made clear to anyone unless you have actually been in it. Secondly, no matter how hard you try to reach it, you will never find a way to do it. It's spontaneous, can happen to anyone, but generally speaking, if you've been in once, you will end up going back eventually. There are also a set of rules. These are not written, nor do I claim them to be a factual representation of real state's true reality. But what during the years I've managed to see as axioms may hold some answers to how real state works that I can point and explain bit by bit. Number one, never try to escape. Number two, be always calm. Don't show any signs of anxiety. Number three, do not search for others. Do not ask for anyone. Number four, stay as close to your entrance as possible. Number five, never directly stare at any source of light. Number six, should you lose your senses, do anything to regain them, even if it means cutting off a part of your body. Number seven, always check if the time is what you remember it to be. Number eight, do not touch a wall that seems darker than the one next to it. Number nine, should you come across another human being, do not make eye contact and move away from each other as fast as possible. Number 10, count seconds and after every 500, remember who you are and where you came from. Number 11 is the most important. Sit down and do not look at the sounds when you hear them. I'm going to explain these one by one. Number one, never try to escape. This is crucial to understand that thinking about how to escape makes your mind go haywire, panic, and eventually you lose yourself in it, running around and away from your entry point. Losing your senses will eventually extend onto your track and perception of time itself, which is why you should always check on it. Count seconds and always try to remember who you are. If everything fails, go to extremes. You don't need a knife to hurt yourself. Bash head first into a wall if you must, and you must regain your senses. I learned this the hard way, but getting yourself calm, point two, is important to thinking straight and crucial to really getting out. You are not going to run out of this. How many kilometers you would run You'll never escape it this way. It's your emotions keeping the rooms extending. At least that's one of my assumptions. Another one has to do with point three and nine. Do not search for others. Do not interact with them should you bump into anyone. You do not know who they are, how they react, and how long they've been there. This is why you count seconds. If you lose track of time, you lose track of reality, and then your emotions which is what can get you into a nasty situation and can even mean your death. Most of the times others don't know it, wandering aimlessly further and further away from their entry point. They are quote unquote lost to time because time in real state doesn't follow our space time continuum rules. It relies on you to keep it meaningful. Think of it as if the time had no concept in real state and only the beings that perceive it can understand and think it. But other than you thinking seconds, it is closely to non-existent there. I say closely because there are multitude beings whom still perceive it in their minds. Coming across one another shows signs that time only means a variable in a form of a living being. And these living beings can be anything. I call it real state because it strips down the reality of its dimensions that we humans coherently understand to be a physical world. There is no real space that you can measure there. Sure, you could measure the rooms, calculate its density, but then, if you would check the atmosphere, there wouldn't be any oxygen or any other particle in it. Breathe in consciously and try to comprehend what had just happened. And then, remember, be 
calm. There's only the timeless perception stretching endlessly before you. That extends onto any other being that happens to be within. Any, meaning not only human. I call them plainly, others. If you're not careful, and you know clip out of reality in the wrong areas, you will end up in the back rooms, where it's nothing but the stink of old moist carpet, the madness of mono yellow, the endless background noise of fluorescent lights at maximum hum buzz, and approximately 600 million square miles, and approximately 600 million square miles of randomly segmented empty rooms to be trapped in. God save you if you hear something wandering around nearby, because it sure as hell has heard you. The first time I saw one was also the first time I was in real estate. I was already panicking, already wandered too far, and lost track of time. I lost my senses seeing otherworldly creatures that I can only describe as a crystalline form of ants the size of a giraffe. I turned around and ran, screaming. I didn't think about escaping from there and then, just from the creature, which is why I think I ended up being let go from the real estate. This had led me to one conclusion that much later came as this. Sit down. Do not look at whatever came in. As far as you are concerned, there are only intelligent beings in there. Seeing how I haven't come across any insect or large animal, which as you'd think would greatly outnumber the total amount of humans, right? The other beings, whatever they might be, are of no concern to us. We cannot converse, we cannot understand each other, or help one another. There's no point in agitating ourselves further in that situation. Points five and eight might come as weird after coming to understand the real estate as an unchangeable constant, but it is also precisely why these points come out a somewhat exotic but logic phenomena. First of, the light source. Real state has no real source of light. I presume the light is there because your perception demands it. Perhaps if you're blind, your mind would create a more fitting environment. But for me, it seems to be an unchanging bright orange light. Not like the first picture, but again, different perceptions. So. If the light is always the same, whenever you go, what about pulsating light that seems to suddenly appear behind you or show up in another room? I like to call these white holes, as in the proposed reversals of black holes. One of my assumptions to the reality behind the back room is that it's a tunnel that we somehow end up in, coherent enough to observe and touch, but not act upon. Perhaps the other beings use it consciously which is why they never seem to be interested in us. I was, after all, never harmed by them. But here comes the dark wall. It completely obliterates the previous concept, because dark walls are the actual exit slash entrance points, and not the white hole that it would suggest to be. Why then stay away from them if those are entries slash exits? For the same reason, you should stick close to your own entry point. Imagine, a space not distorted by time, a seemingly unending one, with your own private entrance. How many more like these are there, and each leading to other points in space and time, or something completely by us not understood? This is also why I wrote that the back room is a fitting name. Perhaps it's the back of our consciousness. Point is clear here, however. Stay clear of the dark walls, but your own entry point. There's also a discrepancy here as to the entry point. Sometimes, you can get ejected from the room completely randomly. It can happen right away, or a month, or a year in. I got myself ejected while running away from the other being, but I also got myself ejected while being completely calm. This would conclude my observations on what the real state slash back room is but I still wait till the day I again enter it. Each time I come more prepared than last, and each time I understand more and more. Theory two. The back rooms are a maze like labyrinth of prefabricated rooms used to load reality. 
those that are quite psychotic or on the verge of seeing through reality often end up clipping out of the matrix and can end up in the back rooms. Individuals often find the rooms have a feel like that of rooms in the late 60s and 70s. Though the lights are on, there are no switches. Many people simply starve to death trying to find an escape, resorting to trying to eat the dry board or carpet of the structures. Individuals attempt to find moisture in the walls and build a dwelling within the old 70s empty rooms, building carpet beds and trying to find respite from the ever bright green lights in order to sleep. In order to escape the back rooms, you must become fully convinced that this is where you're meant to be and feel as if you're moving through your own house or workspace. Only then will your home or old dwelling materialize around you and you will be out of the back room matrix. Individuals who have escaped the back rooms often feel like they are still in it and are permanently psychologically damaged from the understanding that their real life is inherently false. Many individuals often end up killing themselves. I felt that after all of this time and all of this hype, that people would like to know that one of the biggest internet horror fads, once again, comes from 4chan. And while I have my own opinions about the backrooms, I can at least enjoy and respect the Lovecraftian incomprehensible side towards the concept. Thanks for watching. As always, much love to my Patreon supporters for helping the channel stay afloat. If you pledge, you get early access and exclusive content, and the price you pay is all up to you. Anyway, please like and subscribe and all that stuff, but only if you want to. I'm your host, Time6. I hope you enjoyed your stay, and have a good night. Mm -hmm.